and good evening and welcome to the first online event of the 2023 York Festival of Ideas. It's an enormous pleasure to welcome all of you here this evening. It's a sunny evening in York and I hope it's sunny where you are too. My name is Joan Cannon, and I'm Director of York Festival of Ideas and I'll be chairing today's event. It's my huge pleasure to welcome you to this new themed event uh, in collaboration with our fantastic, uh, wonderful partners at the French Embassy. The Festival of Ideas is 12 years old today, but our ethos of delivering free events that educate, entertain and inspire diverse audiences around the world remains our true core mission. A few technical notes before we begin. If you're watching live, you can ask questions using the Q&A function uh, on your screen. It's, it's at the bottom of most devices. This is available throughout the event and questions can be asked at any time. If you have any technical issues, such as a loss of Wi-Fi, you can rejoin the event using your Eventbrite uh, uh, original uh, Zoom link. Please also remember that today's event is also being recorded. So you'll be able to watch it again on our York Ideas YouTube channel. Subtitles are also available um, at this event. So to turn those on or off, use the CC Live transcript button at the bottom of your screen. So I am absolutely delighted to welcome our speakers today for this session entitled Africa and Europe, Reversing Points of View. As I said, it's in partnership with the French Embassy in the UK and they are a long-standing festival um, partner. I'll introduce each of our speakers in turn, and ask them to spend just around five minutes telling us a little about their background and perspectives on the topic, after which I'm really looking forward to a great discussion with the panel and with everyone on the call as our audience. Uh, there'll be an opportunity for me to put your questions to the panel towards the end of the session, but honestly, pop your questions into the Q&A at any time and we'll scoop them up at the appropriate time. So now let me turn to our brilliant panel. I'm going to invite all of them to turn on their cameras uh, so I can introduce them in turn. First, it's my enormous pleasure to welcome Dr. Sarah Dunstan. Sarah is a lecturer in the International History of uh, Modern Human Rights at the University of Glasgow. And she is also a Leverhulme Early Career Fellow. Uh, her first book, Race, Rights and Reform, Black Activism in the French Empire and the United States from World War I to the Cold War, was awarded the American History Historical Association's 2022 J. Russell Major Prize. She's published on questions of French Empire, decolonization and citizenship in the Journal of Modern History, the Journal of the History of Ideas, Gender and History, the Journal of Contemporary History and Kowloon, amongst other places. Next, I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Noram Ajari. Noram Norman is a French and American philosopher. Before becoming a lecturer in Francophone Black Studies at the University of Edinburgh, he served as an assistant professor of philosophy at Villanova University in the suburbs of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He specializes in the history of Francophone and Anglophone Black thought, social and political uh, philosophy, critical race theory and Black male studies. His first book, Dignity or Death, Ethics and Politics of Race, developed a critique of continental philosophy from the perspective of black radical tradition. His second book, Noir Sir, uh, Race, Genre, Class et Pessimisme dans la pensée africaine américaine. Oh, um, oh see, I'm going to miss on the, <laughs> the 21st <Continuum>. uh, century. <laughs> I knew I was going to get that wrong reflects on the contemporary resurgence of a long tradition of black radical pessimism under the guise of contemporary American, uh, African-American intellectual movements, such as Afro-pessimism and black male studies. And then it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Stephen Chan, OBE. Stephen is a leading authority on international politics and relations, particularly involving China, Africa, and the West. Stephen advises governments, businesses, and NGOs around the world. He's advised the Foreign Office and worked with the State Council of the Chinese Prime Minister. He served as a member of the Africa-China-US Trilateral Dialogue to establish trading rules and is widely credited with greatly contributing to the understanding of international politics in general and African politics in particular. He's twice been Dean of the School of Oriental and African Studies in London and has published 35 books, supervised 40 successful PhD theses. He's won the 2010 International Studies Association Prize, eminent scholar in global development, and broadcasts and lectures internationally. He was appointed an OBE for services to Africa and higher education in 2010. And finally, it's my enormous pleasure to introduce Benedict Fevre Tavigneau, Associate Professor of Strategy at HEC, a world-class business school in Paris. She is co-founder and executive director of the HEC Society and Organizations Institute, aimed at developing new ways of thinking about the role of business and society through teaching and research. 
Benedict is a board member of several foundations and associations. She is um, a board member of a media company and president of the board's CSR committee. He is a member of the Scientific Committee of S&P Sustainable Finance and also of the ESG Network of Institute of French Administrators. Her research focuses on reverse innovation. She is studying the processes through which social businesses and the base of the pyramid business models can be a lever for innovation and strategic renewal. She has a PhD in Management Sciences and prior to this she worked for 15 years in the consulting industry at Euroquip uh, Consulting Group and also at Philips as a controller. So without further ado, I think it's fair to say we have an enormously distinguished panel this evening to explore these issues. I'm certainly going to learn a lot and I'm sure all of you are as well. I'm now going to hand over to Norman to kick off the evening. Uh, we will move from one speaker to the other, uh, post your questions as we go, and then let's pick up the conversation once all of our speakers have enlightened us further. Thank you very much, Norman. Thank you. Thank you for this very generous presentation. Thank you to for, for the uh, thank you to the festival. Thank you to the embassy for um, organizing or letting this this uh, panel uh, happen. So what I'm going to do in the next five minutes is just to introduce some elements to understand what, in my view, has been one of the most uh, fruitful encounters between European ideas and um, African and um, Afro-diasporic intellectuals, say Pan-Africanism, uh, Pan-Africanism as a political project. Pan-Africanism is a theory or set of theories and a political project uh, whose aim is twofold. First, to unite or to find common grounds between Black people all around the world. In the diaspora and on the African continent. And the second aspect of it, the more, the, the more political aspect of Pan-Africanism has to do with the building of what Marcus Garvey named the United States of Africa, that is to say, in other words, the unification of continental Africa or sub-Saharan Africa, depends on the interpretation of the project. So um, Pan-Africanism as a project was born in the, in the, the, the diaspora with uh, intellectuals of the Caribbean and um, uh, North, uh, Northern America but it has been transfigured by African intellectuals and, and politicians such as uh, Kwame Nkrumah in Ghana or uh, Julius Nyerere in Tanzania. Both were the first presidents of those, um, of those, of those countries, of those newly independent countries. And both um, build upon this diasporic project of unifying Black communities and the Black race and updated the idea and tried to use it and to reinvent it towards their goal of um, uniting the African continent, leading to, for instance, the first uh, constitution of, uh, oh no, the second, sorry, the second constitution, I think, if I'm not mistaken, of Kwame Nkrumah Ghana planned to um, nullify the country's um, the, the, the country's sovereignty in favor of a African unity. So it's a very interesting idea that those newly independent countries were actually just temporarily vessels for African um, and black power and uh, political influence. Those countries were not meant, in other words, to last. They were meant to be a pedestal or a step towards the unification of the whole continent. Um, in Pan-Africanist discourse of the middle of the 20th century, um, a question was 
particularly central. And it, it's, interest, int it's interesting to note that since um, the role this question plays in African um, in theoretical and political discourse is quite different from the role it plays in European discourses at the same time. And the name of this concept is the concept of ideology. And as you may know, with uh, Marx and then with authors such as uh, Althusser, um, European left-wing theorists are really not a fan of ideology as a theory, since ideology often defines our ima the imaginary relation we have toward the world. In other words, if we are um, expressing ideas ideologically, it means that we are not correctly reflecting on the world. On the world, we are not adequately describing the world. Um, but many Pan-Africanists wanted to create or to adopt an ideology. For instance, in 1960, uh, um, Caribbean intellectual Franz Fanon, uh, after a Pan-African conference said that what Africa needs is actually an ideology. Because in this, con in this context, ideology is not a false relation to the world. It is not a false representation of the world. It is a way of reinventing our way of seeing the world as in black history, it has been deprived of historicity. As black people has been de described as lacking intellect, as lacking history, as lacking um, ways to invent polities that would last or that would, would be as um, efficient as European or North American polities. So in this context, ideology was considered to be quite important. And I think that's why um, as a theory, even if the project somehow failed throughout the years, but I think that's why uh, Pan-Africanism as a, as a theory, as a set of ideas and as a political project is still vivid and relevant today. Uh, but I think I've uh, had my five minutes, so I will let uh, my colleague, um, Dr. Sarah Dunstan, uh, talk now. Uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Norman. Um, that was so interesting. Um, so today, um, I want to talk a little bit sort of in, in relation to Norman's uh, comments about Pan-Africanism. I want to talk about a moment of of possibility and of reform uh, for the relationship between Europe and Africa that happened in the aftermath of the Second World War, when an older form of, of world order and government had been ruptured by a very violent conflict. So in the decades of the 1940s and 1950s, conversations about the future of Europe and Africa took place in the context of continued, albeit contested, colonial activity for European countries like France. The officials of the new Fourth Republic were faced with the difficult task of rebuilding post-war France in an increasingly tense Cold War context, the simulation of this new European economic community, while also grappling with the thorny question of continuing or discontinuing colonial rule. And the newly minted French constitution granted colonial subjects uh, French nationality and expanded political rights, like the vote, that had long been barred to the majority of these populations. And one of the people involved in crafting this new France was the elected deputy for Senegal, Leopold Sidar Senghor. Now, Senghor had first come to Paris as a student in the interwar period, and he quickly become active in a network of African diasporic thinkers who critiqued colonialism and imperialism. Um, alongside the Martinican poet and later politician, Aimé Suzer, and the French Guyanese poet and politician, Léon Gontrain de Mas. He was involved in developing the political literary movement known as Negritude, which entailed the assertion of African people's uh, humanity and a critique of the uh, inherent racism of European ideologies and, and politics. 
Now, Senghor would ultimately go on to become the first president of newly independent Senegal in the, in the early 1960s. But in the years that immediately followed the Second World War, the path of independence was not a foregone conclusion, nor was it even one that thinkers like Senghor believed would actually be necessary to achieve decolonization. So instead, Senghor, alongside allies like his Sudanese colleague, uh, Gabriel Dabissier, shared the strategic objective of a multinational French state in which the former colonies would have equal status with European France. And this multinational state uh, would be part of a larger post-war sort of European political economic bloc. Now for Senghor and Dabissier, the historical reality of empire had created a context in which Europe and Africa were deeply entwined and mutually constitutive and they pushed for the radical recognition of this interdependence, one that did not see merely the asymmetrical assimilation of African peoples into France, a kind of uh, new form of old empire, um, but instead they advocated for a formal relationship of equal territories, um, a kind of federalized political entity that took seriously African peoples and formally recognized their ownership of African natural resources, whilst, re whilst retaining relationships with France and Europe more broadly. In July 1949, for example, during the discussion on France's accession to the Council of Europe, uh, an early precursor to the European Union, Senghor reminded his parliamentary colleague, as you know, the subject of this debate is not only Europe, it is Europe in principle, but in reality, it is Eurafrique. Even on the legal level, it is not France that would enter the Council of Europe. It is the French Republic. And you know that under the constitution, the French Republic is not only composed of the metropolis, but still the overseas departments and territories. So as I have mentioned, this is not a future that came to pass. The prospect of a multinational people's union was blocked by the French right in parliament. And as we know, um, countries uh, that had previously been under French rule gained their independence in Africa and elsewhere. However, the idea of Eurafrique had a multivalent appeal across the political spectrum in this period. So there were competing imperial visions of what Eurafrique meant, which recognized the interdependence, even if not in the egalitarian way that Senghor and Dabissier hoped for. And these ideas had their origins in 19th century uh, concepts of European empire. And so even as Senghor was advocating for an equal partnership, others, such as the then governor of Algeria, Hubert Deschamps, were deploying the term in very different ways. So Deschamps, for example, saw the natural resources of Africa as Europe's last chance to recover from the economic destruction of the Second World War. Indeed, at the height of the Algerian War, which took place from 1954 until 1962, the term was used to defend continued French control and presence in Algeria. And later, when French defeat seemed imminent in this period, it was deployed to argue for deeper entrenchment of empire in those parts of sub-Saharan Africa that were still under French control. And those more ambitious still believed that a unified uh, Europe that retained colonial ties to Africa offered an alternative, a third way, so to speak, to the American Soviet bipolar world of the Cold War, providing a third locus of power it might constitute a means to prevent the very much feared future nuclear war. So as African countries left the French community in the late 1950s and 1960s, these kind of visions of a formal uh, union or institution or relationship between Europe and Africa at the level of, of sort of a bigger political entity faded, but the dynamics of that longer history of interconnection remained. And it is their legacy that we still grapple with today, um, and aspects of which my colleagues are about to discuss. So without further ado, I'm going to pass on to um, Dr. Stephen Chen. I'm delighted to be here. I want to thank the organizers of this event. I want to thank the York Festival of Ideas for 
having this event go on as part of its program. I want to talk today about how we perceive each other, who perceives the other better. And I want to reverse the whole idea of perceiving better. There's been a long acceptance of the fact that many scholars have written about it, that the periphery understands the center much better than the center understands the periphery. So if I can start with a non-African example, when Samuel Huntington wrote what I think is an infamous book called The Clash of Civilizations, he used almost no Arabic or Farsi footnotes at all. The Iranian response in their publications was not only to post a counter argument, a comprehensive counter argument, but to load it up with so many European and American footnotes, it shows they were completely aware of debate, of cultural perceptions in the Northwest, far more than a leading American academic was of debate and cultural animations in the Middle East. And I think this is the case with Africa as well. We often tend to forget that before formal colonialism actually began, the Ashanti nation of Ghana, for instance, was trading on the London stock market in futures and in commodities. They were doing this by themselves. They didn't need anyone to help them. They worked it out. They were understanding the ways of international capitalism long before it turned into an imperialism that colonized them. And what you heard in the years that followed in terms of movement between the two continents, Africa and Europe. We had great scholars coming here to Europe. Uh, we've just talked about how saint Gaul came to France and made an impact there in France. It had a huge impact in starting off the whole idea of an African intellectual movement that was African and which could reply to Europe. But he wasn't the only example. Cabral, for instance, when he came to study at the University of Lisbon, he was able to talk to other students of his age and basically had a profound influence on the young captains and colonels who launched the Portuguese revolution of 1974 that overthrew the fascist dictatorship. They credited the debates they had with Cabral for the animation, the intellectual substance to set about their own changes in their own society. But Cabral was very, very famous, not only for leadership of rebellion and an independence movement in his own country back in Africa, but also for speeches that he made, particularly in Havana, Cuba, on the nature of Marxism and how Marxism had to be viewed anew in order for its class analysis to have any true relevance to Africa. And what he depicted there was in fact a far greater knowledge of Marxism than many so-called Marxist intellectuals in Europe. So the periphery knows very, very well what is going on. And this has been aided and abetted by the development of African universities. As early as the 1970s, the great historian of universities in the world, Eric Ashby, said there was absolutely no reason why African universities, and he singled out McKenry in Uganda, Yebaden in Nigeria, why they could not quite easily rise to the international gold standard epitomized by universities like Cornell. And in fact, they have in many respects. I've taught at African universities. I lived for many years in Zambia as a member of the faculty of the University of Zambia, but also visiting member of faculties in many other parts of Africa. And the debate that goes on of a very high intellectual order in these universities is something that would put European universities to shame when they come to debate Africa, the condition and the future of Africa. The future and the condition of Europe and of the United States is well known. And like the Iranians, the use of European sources can be profound and extremely impressive. If we look at Valentin Mugimbe's work about an African gnosis or a hidden knowledge, although he's advocating the appearance soon, imminently, of an eruption of African knowledge not previously known or at least not previously appreciated by the West, he's able to use Western sources, intellectual sources, to garnish his intellectual 
argument, not to substantiate it, but to garnish it. In other words, a very, very profound and subtle usage of a deep knowledge of European ideas. And I think that if you'll find that in the work of the current, as it were, intellectual star of African epistemology, the brother and Lovold Kasheni, now taking up a post at the University of Bayreuth in Germany, what you have in all of his works, which deal with the appearance and the possibility and the importance of the development of an African episteme, an epistemic community and an epistemic commitment, is that he also is able to use European ideas and thinkers to show the possibility of what he's trying to introduce in terms of ways that African think, which is every bit as complex as any kind of thought system developed in Europe. So what you've got is an appreciation south to north, which the north can't reciprocate. The periphery knows the center much better. And of course, in changing world conditions, will the center remain the center much longer? Don't forget that in the movements of the world, what you have is the rise of China right now, my parents' home country. They also were looked down upon once upon a time. And now China probably knows America much better than America who know China. This is happening with Africa as well, a reversal, an intellectual reversal, a perceptual reversal. So I hope I've said a few things that are provocative. And with those few things, I'm delighted to hand over to my colleague who will then next speak. So hello, this is very much thank you for inviting me and thank you to the organizers and uh, to the three uh, brilliant panelists before me. Um, my intervention, I think, will be very different. Uh, it will be more kind of a testimony based on two things. First, uh, uh, my recent experience of you know co-creating and co-moderating a program uh, in Africa for African managers. So it's a Pan-African program built by uh, HEC Paris with the French Development Agency and two African institutions, so Mohamed VI University and um, University of Cape Town. And uh, it's a program that is related to business and sustainability. So the idea is to develop the capacities of these managers and leaders so that they can become change makers, integrating sustainability and business capacities also in their, uh, in their practices and uh, becoming change makers in a way. So this is the first uh, uh, dimension experience uh, that I can share here. And also um, I can, uh, you know, my intervention is based on my problem, my research uh, that I've been doing for many years on reverse innovation. So this is a concept that is not so theoretical, it's more uh, practical. And uh, it has been developed by an American uh, researcher Govinda Rajan, who wrote an article in Harvard Business Review in 2000 something, uh, 2001 or, or 11, sorry, 11, on uh, you know how um, big multinationals going to, uh, from the Northern countries, going to the South and trying to sometimes to just replicate the products that they have designed in, uh, in their own countries. Uh, sometimes just fail. So it's, it was the case with uh, uh, electrocardiogram developed by General Electric, who tried to sell it in uh, India, and it completely failed because it was not adapted to the needs of the people there. And how um, you know uh, General Electric completely reviewed its uh, practice and developed a more reverse innovation way of doing things. So um, developing something completely disruptive with Indian uh, engineers and, um, and uh, you know, developing a very frugal uh, electrocardiogram that uh, at one point could be replicated in the US. Uh, so in a reverse innovation way and fitting some specific needs like uh, uh, 
uh, road accidents or you know electrocardiogram that could be sold in uh, in poor uh, hospitals so <clears throat> my experience of uh, you know this african uh, program is something close to this concept of reverse innovation so what we bring in a way as a European academic uh, institution is uh, our uh, knowledge on sustainability and the work that uh, we share with the participants on how to design uh, disruptive business models that will be more sustainable, low carbon, circular, uh, inclusive. So, and uh, all our works on sustainability, and actually, we learn a lot from them, and, uh, and and we again realize how much countries like France, like European countries, can have to learn from, for example, African countries on issues related to sustainability. So how to design products and services that are more frugal, and um, how to live with uh, scarce resources, like uh, you know scarce. Uh, water, care energy, care metals, and so on. So reinvent the way we uh, consume and, and also develop our own products in a more, much more frugal way. So here uh, I can give some examples like uh, mobile banking uh, that has been uh, developed for <clears throat> people who don't have access to bank accounts. And at the end, something that is uh, replicable and um, and scale in many different countries and uh, in European countries also, and for any kind of consumers at the end. Uh, I can mention also the, the example of uh, Air Liquide, the French big company that has been, uh, you know, uh, designing um, uh, very top uh, quality uh, oxygen uh, bottles. Uh, and that, uh, you know, working in Africa, decided to develop much more frugal uh, oxygen bottles to sell everywhere at the end also. Um, and I'd like also to maybe conclude with uh, something that uh, I think we can learn from Africa uh, when we look at all the crises we are all facing, like, you know, obviously COVID crisis, today the war uh, with Ukraine and uh, uh, and the inflation and climate change and all the crises we'll be probably facing in the next years. So uh, I think that to face all these crises, we need to be more resilient. And to be more resilient, I think that uh, the sense of community that we see probably more in Africa than in countries like uh, France or European countries where sometimes, unfortunately, also individualism uh, has been rising. Uh, this, you know, this sense of community, the social ties that make people at the end resilient. Uh, these are very important things that we, we can learn from uh, African countries, for example. So thank you very much, Benedict, and thank you, everyone. I'd like to invite the panel to all come on camera and uh, take their mute buttons off now. That was really, really fascinating, and I certainly learned a lot. Uh, I wanted to ask a, a sort of meta-level question at the start, and then we'll take some questions from the audience. We started off with the, the kind of the big scale foundational concepts and precepts for Pan-Africanism. And I wonder, Norman, well, actually all of you, from a historical and a contemporary perspective, how does this um, goal, very laudable goal, of creating a powerful, aligned um, diaspora community with the different nations in Africa coexist, if I think now, about the, um, the threats in the, in the EU context of fragmentation? The, the idea of national sovereignty um, bearing in mind, Norman, your, your um, very interesting articulation of those countries as being temporary constructs. But in a current context, do you see any opportunities um, that are perhaps not that entire Pan-African vision, but how do you see that national sovereignty across the continent of Africa coexisting with the idea of Pan-Africanism? Well, in... In this context, um, 
so far, this this project of union has been a deeply failed project. It has been it, it has been a, a um, yes, a, a complete failure. And the, the failure as as numerous. You know, we mentioned we mentioned Senghor. So um, at first, like when when the goal. Uh, um, granted independence to those countries. Uh, Senegal and Mali used to be one one country. Um, and even even here, like in, in uh, 1960, it didn't work, right? Um, afterwards, uh, as I said, uh, the, the constitution, the Ghanaian constitution planned to plan to to abandon its own sovereignty in favor of a uh, union or a unification of, the, of several countries. Sekou Touré joined in uh, in Guinea and like made the same arrangement in Guinea's own constitution and it failed. Um, we have many forms of, of nationalism, separatism in, in, in those countries. So th th this, whole, this whole idea, this whole Kwame Nkrumah and other an African Yeri idea that we need to act quick so that those made up new countries, new sovereignties, don't end up coalescing in um, actual European-like nations mm -hmm. and that they do not create, they, they, they do not invent forms of national identity that were not meaningful to those individuals. Um, this whole project uh, failed. But the problem is, like the ideology failed, so, so to speak. But the problem is the, the different problem, the different issues those nation, um, those new nation uh, a cause are not over, right? The fact that they were engineered and designed like explicitly, uh, for instance, in the case of, of, of De Gaulle, um, they were explicitly designed not to be sustainable on their own. Uh, to, they were designed to be um, hubs to create resources for the metropole. And so they, the, the many issues they pose are not over. So um, Pan-Africanism, I think, as an ideal and as a militant project for, for for instance you have many parties many political parties in different in different countries for instance in senegal since we were talking a lot about senegal you have the party funded by uh, created by sheikh anta diop the very famous uh, egyptologist intellectual but he was also committed an africanist and 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 militant so his party his political party was outlawed for for time by senghor uh he, 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 became a driving force in the 70s, uh, 80s and stuff. So in many countries are have, this, have the same kind of political parties, Pan-Africanist political parties. So we have many grassroots organizations. We have many project, uh, projects of, of that sort. And we cannot say, at least that's my, that, that's my, 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 my uh, conviction me it's obvious that uh, politically they're relevant uh, today and I'm, I'm pretty sure um, if drastic reforms do not happen uh, pan-africanism will keep happening uh, cyclically as a possible answer to uh, issues and political political conflict so on that final point, um, would any of the um, Stephen, Sarah, um, Benedict, would you like to come in on that on that point of cyclical, uh, cyclical the nature of, of Pan Africanism um, and its relationship with the West? Well, I have a very simple logistical view of Pan Africanism. I think as a concept, as a driving philosophy, it's highly desirable. Of course, the United States of Africa would be a power in the world, but logistically, right now, it's impossible and it would be logistically impossible for some time. I can't drive across Africa. I can't drive Africa north to south. I can't go anywhere without flying back to London or Paris first. 
which is ridiculous. So to join up the continent is an absolute prerequisite to being able to envisage how to make a Pan-Africanism actually work. In other words, it's no good simply conceptualizing Pan-Africanism. We can do that. We've been doing that for quite some time. Operationalizing it is the very, very difficult thing. And that requires infrastructure. This is where, curiously, all the criticism of China and Africa has, let us say, a double-edged sword element to it. Because insofar as China is building infrastructure that no one else will build, roads and railways, the possibility of joining up at least parts of Africa, so the communications, so the delivery of goods and services, and so that government and governance is possible, that is something to be applauded. The Chinese once had a scheme to build a road, rail, and telecommunications highway across the entire south of the Democratic Republic of Congo. That would have made the warlords in the southeast of Congo impossible. The West vetoed that because they feared Chinese influence would grow as a result. And what it means is now a war that's gone on. We've had something like our estimates at SOAS anyway, 2 million civilian deaths and 5 million cases of gender side, raping of women as a weapon of war because of superpower rivalries and suspicions. But really, whoever does it or whoever helps the Africans do it, the continent needs simply to be joined up in order to operationalize any concept, strong or soft, of Pan-Africanism. So building on that, Benedict, and you talked about your version of re uh, reverse innovation and the engagement you have. Um, in fact, you, Stephen, as well, talked about the engagement with African, uh, a variety of African universities. Is that a logical place to start that academic collaboration to help create the educational infrastructure to drive some of that more operational aspects of unifying the continent? Well, actually, uh, I can say yes through our maybe small experience to that, uh, you know, this, uh, this experience of building a program with something like in different nationalities, African people from uh, 15 nationalities is an, in a way a unique experience, I, I would say. And we see that um, they don't have so many opportunities uh, to, to meet, you know, people from uh, Western Africa, Eastern Africa, South Africa, North Africa, all together. And also, uh, I think, uh, studying, working on a very specific topic that can unify them, which is on building a sustainable Africa in a way. So they understand that uh, Africa like the world in a way is a small village, we are all interdependent. And uh, yeah, they all have probably to fight against uh, yeah, climate change, you know, biodiversity depletion, resource scarcity of any kind and uh, rising inequalities. So I think that they understand that they cannot be change makers alone in their uh, country, they have to build also Pan-African networks to be stronger. And uh, they have to build this regional integration um, to be stronger in front of well, yeah, all the rivalries that you mentioned, Stefan, but also uh, to make things different in terms of sustainability, because it's, it's the main focus of our, of our program. And I think that they realize how um, vulnerable uh, they all are in front of climate change and all these uh, mega challenges. Sarah, did you want to come in on any of those points before I turn to some very interesting questions that are posed by our audience? Um, yeah, sure. I just wanted to underline the point that I think um, Norman made very well, which is that um, Pan-Africanism you know, is, is definitely multivalent, right? There's the form that sees the, the creation of these, these national um, sort of entities in Africa and the drive for, the, you know, United States of Africa, perhaps. But there's also Pan-Africanism in the context of, you know, a sustained critique of, of capitalism, of imperialism, of racism. And, you know, I'm thinking of, um, if we look at the 1960s, 
um, and look at the, the conflict in Algeria and, and then someone like um, Malcolm X, for example, visiting the Kasbah in Algiers and making these connections between what's happening in Algeria and the kind of civil rights battles and sort of black power movements that are occurring in the United States and making a kind of critique of racism and making a, a sort of cry for a more egalitarian sort of world in this moment. And I think that's an important aspect of, of Pan-Africanism as well, that it's a really, it's a critical lens for seeing the world that lends itself to, to reform. And, and in addition to that, I would argue that, you know, some of the, the more binding aspects, if you like, of human rights, uh, sort of covenants and legislation that come out of the 1960s and international order in the United uh, Nations in the 1960s come from pressure that's placed by Afro-Asian coalitions in the General Assembly um, on um, sort of, you know, uh, United States and, and European power books. And I think it's important to, you know, to add to what my colleagues have said, I think it's important to think about sort of Pan-Africanism and, and African influences in this you know, diverse array of, of ways. That segues very nicely into a question I'm going to pick up in the, uh, the Q&A around Etta asks, what are the ethical considerations uh, in Europe's partnerships with Africa today? Um, I'd like to, <laughs> Stephen, you look like you're going to jump in on that one. <laughs> well, the ethical considerations have got many, many dimensions, of course, and economic exploitation mm -hmm. is still very, very much part of how we deal with Africa and a whole host of other countries too, I hasten to add. Although that is a game that is being played both ways now. When Somali pirates, for instance, were able to use British banks to launder their money in an extremely expert way, uh, one asks the question, you know, who is using whom? But basically, if not totally a one-way street, largely still a one-way street where exploitation is key in this it's reflected even in the aid regimes of metropolitan countries, how we give assistance, the conditions of assistance, the seeking of using assistance to create markets rather than genuinely try to help develop sectors. And I think that's mostly epitomized quite a short time ago with the COVID crisis. You know, who controlled what then? Mm -hmm. you know, who had manufactured the pharmaceuticals who had manufactured the respirators, for instance, and the unequal distribution of resources there, with Africa not having been encouraged to develop its own generic pharmaceutical industry, for instance, and not being able and not being encouraged to develop, as it were, machines like respirators. In Zambia, I had two friends die of COVID because there was not a single respirator in the entire country. So that kind of inequality will help, but we won't actually give them what they need to become self-sufficient. All of our help has a glass ceiling, and I find that deeply unethical. Not what we do, but the limits of what we do. And everything we do is a limit. And that is the unethical part of it all, as far as I'm concerned. Anyone else want to come in on this particular question? I guess I had a sub-question of that to Benedict, perhaps, which is a reflection of uh, Macron's policy, which seems both quite transactional, but also picking up on some of the colonial past of the relationship between France and Africa, and whether you feel his slightly more operational aspects of some of his, his recent engagements and visits to various African countries where on the one hand talking about colonial past and cultural artifacts restitutions but also being quite transactional in the economic relationship he foresees between france and particular countries and whether you think from your experience of working with various african colleagues really to any of you um whether you think that is um a better approach or if it's working or you see some challenges ahead between uh, french di diplomatic policy and, and african African nations that they're engaging with? Well, I'm not a specialist of that question, but uh, 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 actually, uh, France has a responsibility, like, um, I think it's it's one of the, 
the objectives of Macron and of June, I think, you know, um, helping uh, yeah, Africa uh, develop uh, itself in a in a green way. And, and we have a responsibility related to um, climate justice. So, so we have to, you know, uh, allocate huge amounts uh, to help Africa, uh, you know, develop uh, renewable energies and uh, green energies in a way. And uh, I know that there is this objective of mobilizing uh, private financing, uh, public financing. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's it's at the heart of all the different COPs, uh, COP twenty seven, uh, for example. Uh, you know this this notion of. Uh, climate justice and we have a huge responsibility here as Europeans and I, well I, I do I do believe that this intention of the next summit in end of June is is coherent uh, with this uh, this need Stephen were you going to come in on this point I could see you nodding but I wasn't sure if you wanted to, to comment as well no I was just completely agreeing a little mm -hmm. bit of it had been saying so related. Well, maybe maybe oh, I, sorry, I, I, can add, I can add something on, on Macron. Mm. It's his, his. I think his method. His method is quite is quite interesting. I guess it, it's a it's a, a little new. Uh, a lot of, a lot of old stuff. For instance, you know, there's you cannot have a French president uh, traveling through through Africa without having some. A polemical moment, for instance, the moment in in in, Cong in Congo, in Chasa, uh, when they were talking about those African arrangements, as they were saying, like implying that they were not that, like African democracy was not so genuine and things like that, and there were there were, there were some some conflicts between Macron and the journalists and uh, the po po politicians there. Um, Macron is always trying to navigate those things, creating these huge summits, such as the one he created in uh, Montpellier, if I remember correct, correctly, Le Sommet Afrique France, with a um, very famous uh, Cameroonian political theorist, Achille Bembe, involved. So he's trying to do those things. But also, at the same time, you have this impossible, seemingly, project to reform the CFA franc, which is quite frankly, the elephant in the room in terms of France Afrique, in terms of these relations, these very complicated, uh, um, say, neo-colonial collaboration between France and some African states, you know, that, that uh, lasted for almost uh, like more than, than almost seven, 70 years now. Uh, so we still, we, let's say we have lots of PR, of course, from Macron, I think, and, and a very smart one, at least sometimes. And the same with the, the question of restitution. Lastly, talked a little bit uh, to the UN about reparations, but of course, not nothing really meaningful. So he's using interesting words, right? He tries to keep updated, but I've not seen any strong and um, say really impactful uh, set of reform that he actually um, started or, or actually created, right? We have lots of words, lots of interesting forums, but uh, nothing like in terms of policy. So continuing slightly on this theme, I want to pick up a question that Sabrina asks in the audience. Has francophobia become an expression for pan-Africanism, brackets, in some cases? Well, insofar as francophonic African nations are in the process of asking questions about their relationship with France, or in some cases outright, outright rejecting forms of cooperation with the French, military cooperation, uh, for instance. That is something which is not impacting at all upon the Anglophonic or the Lusophonic countries. So in terms of a pan-Africanism, if it involves only the Francophonic community, it's only very, very partial. 
And of course, what you've got is a sting in the tail. In terms of ending or curtailing or reducing French military intervention capacities or French soldiers being stationed in Africa, many African governments have turned to other providers of military services like Wagner, mm -hmm. which I take to be the most perfidious and vicious military unit in the world right now. They have no mercy. They shoot, they kill anyone in front of them. It's basically the old Warsaw Pact strategy of taking a steamroller and driving it over everything in front. But this is not how you go to crush insurgencies, particularly those based on faith. It's how to create enemies for the government that is bringing them in. So what you've got in terms of trying to reduce your dependency on France, and I think that African countries should, finding a replacement begs two questions. Is the replacement any better? Or why do you need this help in the first place? Why are you still not self-sufficient? Why are you still alienating your own population so that they rebel? These are very key questions that every African country has got to ask itself. So it's not just a case of what unity you have internationally or within Africa itself. It's also a case of how you treat your citizens. It's very much a case of good governance and in terms of very, very simple things, every nation has got to be able to control its own means of enforcement, security and force. Why are your army so bad? I, I lecture at staff colleges. You know, I've got many students who are African generals and they're very, very conscious of the fact that they're not up to scratch. And when you talk to the soldiers on the ground and peacekeeping forces, Darfur, South Sudan, I've had many students very much involved on the ground there. Where's our equipment? Where are our malaria nets? Where are our, our basic pharmaceuticals and medicines? Where are our support units? Where's our aerial cover? I'll give you an example. When I talked to General Aguay, who was commanding African Union forces in Darfur. Now, Darfur is the size of Texas, okay? And I said, how many helicopters you got? He said, two. And I said, what do you use those two helicopters for in a country the size of Texas? To go see the funerals of my men. Now, these are things that are absolutely essential if Africa's going to stand on its own feet. So it goes across not just civilian governance, but all kinds of issues to do with ensuring that borders, that populations are secure and none of it is up to scratch. I don't want to sound like an Afro pessimist. I think these things have got technical solutions and I would like to see far more thought given to technical solutions. Thank you. Anyone else want to come in on that point before we move on to another question? Okay. Um, Benedict, there's uh, a question here on uh, questioner is anonymous, but asking how can we create a similar sense of community in Europe as seen in Africa to create more resilience, or have we moved too far towards individualism to be able to do this? That's quite a question. Uh, I well, it's a huge question. I think uh, it's uh, it's something I I I want to work on, and I think there are already means that are developed you know to to recreate this sense of community we see lots of innovations related to for example third places um i don't know if you know what it is it's you know places where you will gather um many different people within you know a city for example it will build bridges between different uh um communities and uh, organizing through organizing uh, cultural events um it can be philosophical conferences or you know concerts exhibitions and so on so the idea is to to create these kind of places where everybody can meet and um i think we we see this the development of this kind of uh, of uh, initiatives uh, we also see, uh, since the COVID, uh, the development of, uh, you know, shared, uh, for example, uh, 
in France, it's EP3 participative. It's like um, shared um, shops where everybody participates and looks for the goods and the, the food uh, around locally. And everybody meets on, on the Saturday to get the food and uh, that is only locally produced. So we see, you know, the emergence of lots of these kind of initiatives uh, related to probably the COVID and uh, the raising awareness of uh, whole categories of people who Benedict, you've just slightly broken up, I think. Sorry. Oh, we can hear you again. <laughs> I'm sorry, the, the connection was bad. For a second. Yeah, I have a bad connection, sorry. Uh, so I don't know when I disappeared. Uh, <laughs> I think around that. I, I think yes, we, we see uh, at the same time, you know, because of COVID, because of inflation and all the difficulties that the uh, middle class people or low income people are facing, you know, uh, at the same time, we see more and more individualism um, and also uh, raising awareness of a whole category of people who create these kind of new initiatives. And uh, I think we, we see both. And I'm quite optimistic, but I think that we have to do this kind of education, educating people, young people, and uh, older people as well, to make this solidarity, social ties attractive again. So actually, I'm going to jump to a question that I was going to keep for later because it segues very nicely around that wider um, collaborative infrastructure that might be required. So um, a question here around, we've talked about clearly military capacity and the constraints Stephen has memorably described, but where are the opportunities around education and um, building wider diplomatic, I guess, and, and peaceful relationships between Europe and Africa? Do you see any scalable opportunities from your, your um, various experiences to, to kind of think about education as an enabler. Um, you've clearly all um, had experiences there and um, some at a quite um, very institutional level, but are, are there scalable opportunities to, to do more on the education front, do you think? I think, and we have to learn from the examples of other countries. The British government builds schools, that's what it does, the primary schools. The Chinese will build universities, uh, you know, Every parent wants to send their child to university. The Japanese will build veterinary schools that are an exact replica of veterinary school in Japan, and then deploy retiring professors of veterinary studies to an African country saying, look, it's going to be just like home. We'll pay you the same salary. You teach the locals. This will be transferable skill work as well as being involved yourself uh, in all kinds of veterinary scientific research in a developing country and there's a huge take up but even if you just concentrate on schools as if Africa was mired still in just teach them how to read and write they don't need any more a ridiculous assumption still on the part of many policy makers there's no throughput planning in Britain anyway uh, to get from primary school to secondary school and in particular there's absolutely no planning whatsoever I can say this hand on my heart I'm very close to the aid industry here. No planning whatsoever to ensure that young women make the transition from primary school to secondary school. This is a complete scandal, of course. But what it means is that in terms of development planning, when it comes to education, we've got to get right back to the drawing board and learn from others who are doing better than we and basically eat a bit of humble pie and say, look, we've pretty much got it wrong for some time. We're still stuck in the neo-colonial phase where all people needed was primary schooling to become clerks and kindergarten teachers. You know, we need to educate people at high university level. You know, we need to cooperate with African universities, some of whom are extremely good. So at SOAS, we're just starting a joint degree program and master's level with University of Witwatersrand in South Africa, for instance. But I can think of half a dozen Southern African universities alone in different parts of Southern Africa that could easily step up to the plate and share tuition and joint master's programs with the University 
like my own. Uh, that's not really been taken up by too many British universities, even at the planning stage, and not by too many, as far as I know, American universities. So there's this huge metropolitan lack of commitment based on the metropolitan lack of perception and appreciation of the quality that's out there. Even a country in dire straits like right now, like Zimbabwe, has got 17 public universities. I rate the top five of them. And the others are also RANs, uh, as well as a whole host of private universities that have been accredited by a reasonable means of accreditation. What's coming out of those is a whole intellectual generation that could easily cooperate with our intellectual generations, but they're not encouraged to, we're not encouraging them to, and basically we have to change our mindset in the metropolitan countries as to how we go about this. So that's a very interesting point to segue into another question from Barney um, uh, around the specific opportunities, if you see those opportunities, around the UK Commonwealth having the potential, possibly, uh, of there being an opportunity for building deeper connections between Britain and Africa, particularly as, and I'm reading out the question here, as Britain looks for longer term economic partners outside of Europe because of Brexit. So uh, anyone who wants to jump in on where you see the role of the Commonwealth, um, bearing in mind colonial antecedents and so forth, um, whether you see there's any opportunity to have a reframing of relationships through that channel or um, and picking up on Stephen's, you know, the lack of in-depth knowledge, either at a policy level or at sector level, um, you know, between European countries and what is actually happening and where the opportunities for reciprocal, respectful collaboration with African countries might lie. Norman, what's your perspective in terms of having been in the US and also now in Edinburgh? Um, I mean, I... I'm not. I'm not sure I can. I can make a, a like full-fledged argument about that. I just have just a little some just a little some something to 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 say about about that since I'm not. I've been in the UK for one year and a half, so it's not it's not so much. But what I know and what I find a very interesting, very fascinating phenomenon is to to see um, French-speaking African countries joining the Commonwealth. This is a very bizarre thing. Countries like Togo and Gabon decided to join the Commonwealth thinking, like believing that this community would grant us better opportunities than um, the historical uh, French uh, structure, like the geopolitical structure would ever, would ever do. And I, I'm not knowledgeable enough to <laughs> uh, actually Give an analysis of this of, of this fact, but sounds like the Commonwealth, even if some uh, countries decide to um, leave the Commonwealth on the other side in the Caribbean and stuff, but it sounds like it's appealing to some French-speaking African countries, which I I, I find fascinating. Um, but you know, the the idea or the ideal to to shift from a French to uh, English is a very old, a very old dream of some former French colonies. The first one of whom being Haiti itself, as in uh, like 1810, uh, uh, especially Christophe, the king in the north, <laughs> like like in Game of Thrones. No, nothing. To do with. Uh, but uh, uh, Christo uh, Christ uh, Christophe, uh, the, the first king of of Haiti. Uh, wanted to um, to shift from French to English as well. Made a king in uh, admiration for, for his admiration of uh, uh, British the British traditions and and type of and type of political structure and so on and so forth. Of course, due to the lack of human resources and many different conflicts, uh, it didn't happen. But we have a we have a we have a history of of. Um, believing that uh, the British Empire is better to its Blacks than, than the French one. But I, I, I do not want to, to uh, have a position on that, on, that, on that matter. It's way too political. Sarah, did you want to come in on that? You, or were you? Um, I mean, certainly I, I'm likewise hesitant to to comment on potential future 
uh, <laughs> movement. But I would say that, you know, just to add again to, to Norman, you know, a similar thing happened in uh, the German Cameroon territories at the end of World War One. You know, um, many Cameroonian uh, groups would, would have preferred to end up in uh, under British rule rather than French uh, for sort of similar reasons about traditions around rights and, and democracy. Um, and, and I think that I think what that tells us is that this this history of, of colonialism is something that really needs to be you know grappled with and met head on if if the Commonwealth is to be a promising sort of future space for rapprochement in this post Brexit age. I think you, you can't get away from the the elephant in the room, which is that you know really need to engage with the past and think about what an equal relationship might look like. So I'm going to finish on one, a, a different flavour of question, but I think it's a very interesting question and we probably won't get everybody, but I would be interested in your view. Does the rise of far right ideologies in the US, which seem to threaten the African American population, create the opportunity for the rise of different kinds of Pan-African thinking among African Americans, especially if they feel no longer less safe in a kind of a US environment and Norman you clearly lived in Philadelphia you um, set that historical context of diaspora early on in our discussions what is your reflection around that um the, the way that community thinks about itself now well let's say African American it's, it's, it's a name you know it's a name the, the connection to the connection to continental Africa may exist in some political groups, in some political agendas. There is a huge tradition, but it doesn't represent by far the majority of African Americans as a community. You know, American, American um, nationalism, and even in some cases, chauvinism, I would say is more prevalent than uh, um, say, Pan-Africanism today, even if, as I said, I mean, it, it still is a strong sentiment. It still has a certain traction intellectually and um, educationally. For instance, where I was in, in Philadelphia, it's a strong, very strong tradition of Afrocentricity, Afrocentrism on the one hand, and the Panthers, the, the, the you know, Black radicalism on the on the other hand. So yes, it's, it's, it's very strong, but, I wouldn't say that as, you know, the, uh, that, uh, and despite, you know, the efforts of some governments like Ghanaian government to, to, to say, yes, you have a right to return and stuff, but I do not believe in a massive return of uh, African Americans to, to Africa. Uh, well, because they, they, they vastly believe that it's their country. And on the, on the other hand, um, the, African Americans in the, in the proper sense of the, in the proper sense of the, of the word, that is to say, people from Africa are vastly uh, privileged. You know, uh, for instance, I was born in the, in the U.S. to tell you my story because my father was was a a Nigerian immigrant, and you know that the Nigerian immigrants in the U.S. if they made it to the U.S., it means that they this mod, model my, minority, and those people are not going to leave. They doctors, they they professors, they, they things they things like that. Of course. It's not, you know, uh, uh, a general rule, but we have statistics. They, they, they not, they're not doing bad. You know, they're not doing bad. They, they part of American uh, work, working class, uh, uh, sorry, uh, middle class, and so they will not be the people who will suffer the most if those kind of 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 um, uh, anti-immigrant policies is put in place. You know, I'm not saying they're not suffer they're not going to suffer at all, but I'm not I'm 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 saying uh they're not the main target. The main targets are uh Mexicans and other Spanish speaking peoples. You know, they, they we have to understand that most African immigrants in the US are elite and their main uh sometimes, you know, sometimes their main enemies are the African Americans themselves because they feel like they benefiting unjustly, like the Africans from, from Nigeria, for instance, of, of, of Ghana, they're benefiting unjustly of, of affirmative, affirmative action, sorry, uh, depriving some African-American descendants of slaves 
of some opportunities, which unfortunately is uh, partly true. <laughs> you know, putting minorities one against, against another is a problem. So it's a very vast problem. I, I think I, I said too much, uh, <laughs> but it's a very vast, it's, it's, it's a very vast, uh, very vast problem. But uh, to end, long story short, I, I do not believe they will massively leave the US uh, for for any for Ghana or other other African countries, uh, not the African Americans and not even the Nigerian. So I think it's fair to say that each one of the questions that have been posed this evening, we could easily spent our hour discussing because these are vast questions. Oh, yeah. of course, of course. But let me let me close by asking each of you if you feel broadly a sense of hope or a sense of pessimism, to use Norman's phrase from early on, about the future of Africa and its relationships um, with the rest of the world. But broadly, are you, Stephen, you talked a lot about the investment coming into Africa. Do you feel a sense of hope or the, that you feel there's a sort of exploitative agenda? Um, so just a kind of very quick um, one sentence, hopeful, optimistic or otherwise. There's certainly exploitation, but I'm actually quite hopeful that Africa has got, not meaning to develop it, has got the expertise to be able to counter that in negotiations, international fora. It's just not deploying this expertise as efficiently and as effectively as it can. The wrong people are ministers of foreign affairs, for instance. The right people are there. So that if they were deployed properly, a lot of this easy targeting of Africa would be much, much harder. Benedict, you hopeful? Uh, um, to end with a optimist and, and positive uh, uh, comment, I would say that uh, new uh, regulations that make, uh, for example, in Europe, like the duty of vigilance, that will make the companies uh, or European companies, for example, more accountable related to the, the practices of the supply chain, human rights issues and other environmental issues. So, yeah, I think this can make uh, things move uh, positively uh, if these new uh, regulations are applied, which we don't know yet. Brilliant. Sarah. I mean, I'm an optimist, so always hopeful. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think there are there are lots of amazing initiatives that have the potential to to steer us into a good place, and so ever hopeful. And Norman, final word to you. Well, before the before the the the, um, the meeting start, I, I was looking at what's going on now in Senegal. And uh, there are massive uprisings since uh, President Macky Sall tried to put, well, yeah, uh, tried to put to, to, to jail uh, one of his major uh, opponents. And so let's say I'm a pessimist towards African autocrats, but I'm very optimistic regarding African people and peoples. I think that's a very good place for us to end. I'm slightly over, um, so apologies for being a terrible chair. Um, thank you all so much for such an enlightening evening. I found that absolutely fascinating, and I really want to thank all of you for your time. I want to thank everyone in the audience for abandoning the sunshine and uh, logging on. Don't forget that we will be sending you a link when this is posted on York Ideas YouTube uh, channel as well. But for now, um, thank you very much to everyone um, on our amazingly distinguished panel. I am so, so grateful to all of you for spending the time with us on our first day of your Festival of Ideas. Day one is down and we have 12 more to go and roughly about 195 free events in person, uh, hybrid and online. So I look forward to seeing, hearing or uh, meeting many more audience members as we pursue our theme of re uh, rediscover, reimagine, rebuild. But for now, I wish you all a very, very pleasant rest of the evening. And thank you again to our amazing panel and to our sponsor, the French Embassy. Thank you. <laughs>